Yes, well, it had to happen sometime. We were caught by the fuzz. Welcome, in other words, to our big interview with Detective Sergeant Steve Arnett. This was a voluntary chat and nothing I said was used in evidence against me yet. Line of Duty fans, and there are millions of you, will know all about the waistcoat wearing detective. But most of you won't know that Martin Comston, the actor who brilliantly plays Arnett in the BBC crime drama, is a former professional footballer and he trained at that mecca of football. We call it the home of football, Aberdeen. Pitodri, as a youngster, he was there. We taught him a great deal about his poison charm. So yes, I'm claiming him as a dandy. Martin, anyone who knows him, won't be surprised to know has strong views on how football should be played. We talk about Barcelona's style and the qualities of bravery and technique that he loves in Spanish football. Qualities largely missing from the football culture he grew up in as a small, ball-playing centre-half. Listen out for cameos from Paul Scholes, Paul McStay and Henrik Larsson. This is a wee beauty. Enjoy. Probably my all-time comedy heroes are the Marx Brothers. Really nice people, funny people, tremendous story. We're sitting in the Groucho Club. My team's Aberdeen. I'm sitting opposite an all-time <laughs> dandy's legend. And he's one of Britain's new breed of super cops. DS, Steve Arnett. Everybody was a dandy. Martin Comston, welcome to the Groucho Club. Welcome to the big interview. Whoa, this is exciting. You said you were psyched. I'm psyched. Have I made it up that your football education came in my city at Pataudry? Tell us about it. Um, well, just first, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, big time, uh, big time fan of the show, and you know we've, we've came to know each other over the last couple of years. And thank you for doing the Lennon interview for the hospice and everything for me. But yeah, I'd like to know it's not quite uh, football education was <laughs> was Greenock uh, and Morton, but now I, I signed with uh, Aberdeen. Uh, Youth when I was about probably about thirteen or, or fourteen, so yeah, I spent most of my years. It was it was great times. I mean, they, Aberdeen they had a fantastic youth system. I probably I, I'm not sure as much as I left, but they spent my summers up there, spent my October holidays up there. I was under Roy Aiken at the time, and um, they were great at letting the young boys sort of mix with the first team. So I mean, by the end of end of probably most training days, we all had just a big game. So by thirteen or, or fourteen, you were having a kick about with Joe Joe Miller and Theo Snelders and. Ian Jess and hey, well, you know, he wasn't doing much running, but Dean Windass and all those kind of characters. Yes, listeners, I am drooling. Yes, <laughs> I am. But I really liked it, and we'd uh, so it was a load of boys because uh, they were sort of set up into different uh, areas, and uh, we did most of our week uh, weekday training at Bothwell, mm-hmm. uh, all the West Coast boys, and then for ah. holidays we would we'd go up to Aberdeen. How who spotted you? How were you spotted? And when they saw you, aged. 12, 13, yeah. what did they see in you? Um, I think, if I remember right, the, the, the scout's name is Peter Brain, and um, my my local team before, I mean, cause on and off, I've sort of been with Morton through Boys Club and Morton Youth for nearly 10 years, and uh, we had a great run the Boys Club that year to the Scottish Cup final, uh, where we lost to Celtic, and for what I'm told, the boys are quite adamant, a young Darren Fletcher was on the opposing side. But, Hello, guest. Well, yeah, yeah, and it, I, played, I played against Darren a couple of times, just because um, we were, were same age, and we were uh, sort of like district trials and all that kind of thing. But yeah, I think we'd a, it, was a, it was a great time actually. We came up against some really good teams in that run. But all these bigger clubs were recruiting from all over Scotland and uh, sort of Celtic as well, I think, had boys from Ireland and stuff. And we were just 11 boys for Greenock, all, all literally just pals. And all the thing that really beat us that day is because uh, we had a great run. But I mean, most of us were all Celtic fans and... When the McStays and stuff are on the sidelines and they come out wearing the hoops and all that kind of thing, you know, we were, we were sort of beaten before the game began. So I would even pick you up. I, I, I genuinely would like to know what it was that you did well. What, what, because I, I, I'm asking because I'm yeah, going to get no. to a remark you made to me uh, later on when you yeah, start listening um, to the interview. It was a funny thing. This shows you how long ago it was. I was a sweeper. I could read the game very well and uh, I was very well known for stories for taking chances or what well, I would say just playing out from the back yeah. you know I love to get on the ball and, and <laughs> is, most strikers are absolutely clueless when it comes to making a tackle and uh, so you could read them very easily which way they were going and I always kind of 
something I've always been quite bitter about is a lot of my managers always going, and again, hopefully our game's changing, especially with the, the way Barca and stuff play and people become more educated. It was always, you're going to get caught one day. I'm like, well, what about the last three seasons or something I've played yeah. and I haven't been caught? And I don't think I ever did get caught in the end. I mean, obviously, going up to a higher level, I probably would have. But we just had this mentality, like, when we're getting screamed at for passing the ball in the box. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, if somebody's there and they're, and they're capable on the ball, why not? So I'm a lot, lot older than you, but I remember the rules were, and you were screamed at, yeah. never pass across yeah. your box, yeah. ever. Yeah. And that, that what we've begun to recognise is a curse of yeah. development of football, the lump it, kick it yeah. along. That, I think that, that we've exposed that generally yeah. across the country. We know that. Where did that instinct come from you? We, we, evidently nobody taught you that you could well, play I from the back. It is it I, inherent? Well, because I probably started higher up the pitch. So I kind of had that thought, I was a bit, probably a bit more player, but it turned out I was actually pretty good at reading the game. So I ended up at the back anyway. So playing, I just thought I could get on the ball a bit. I mean, but where we grew up as well, I mean, I've heard this uh, talked about quite a lot in a previous podcast, but it's some uh, street football, you know, so mm. we, we could all play in concrete. But growing up, all we mainly played on was ash pitches, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it wasn't which, conducive which to Which for anybody football. who hasn't played on them or yeah. seen them, which there will be, just describe that. It's basically just stones, you know, it's the best way I can say. It's just, and trying to play... <laughs> any kind of football on that it, it, it's really impossible and it's what is incredibly annoying is when I get I was lucky where I grew up I grew up in a place called the Valley and um, all the houses were around this one big field so we had a big grass pitch to kind of play on mm-hmm. or me and my pals every day after school but in terms of the facilities for young boys it, all we did is play football and um, all weekend we were on these terrible ash pitches but what they thought was they were all weather pitches mm. and then now you see these kids and they've got these beautiful 3G and 4G parts, and they're just lying empty. There's nobody there. No, there's nobody there, and it's just, you think, well, what I wouldn't have done to have them when I was a boy. Because uh, the first after part we got, and they thought it was state of art, and it was just pure flat, and in the winter it was like a, it was like an ice rink. Yeah. You know, people were getting serious injuries, uh, slipping on the thing. But no, I mean, it's, I suppose being a young boy growing up in Scotland, I mean, again, I don't know if times are changing. It was just, it was what you did every single day. You know, and uh, where where I actually, a lot of my pals, we had a, a really good standard, I think. Then my school team, there was seven or eight of us all on S forms, and I think four of us went pro, and two of my close pals went on to have really uh, good careers. Sean Dillon was Young Player of the Month in, uh, in the Scottish League, and I got Young Player of the Year for Kilmarnock. Gary Harkins was captain nice. of Dundee, went on, yeah. won the League Cup with Kilmarnock. So we, we, we had a really good bunch of boys, they were all pals, and we, we could all play of it. At that age... Who did you watch that played the way you liked? Well, I mean, I'm I'm Celtic daft, but I grew up, and this is why I'm absolutely loving it at the minute, I grew up at a time, like, the club was in disarray, you know, I mean, I was born in 84, so probably in like 89, 90 is when I, you start kind of knowing what football is and that, and it was like the worst period in Celtic's history. But Paul McStay, mm. in the middle of that pitch, was just sheer and utter class. Mm-hmm. You know, his range of passing, and just the way he played the game, you know, so Paul McStay and John Collins... Were sort of uh, the two sort of raise a light for for as a Celtic fan, alongside Tommy Burns, Paul McStay epitomises what we believe it is to be Celtic. Just the way he carries himself, you know, the way he's through and through about the club and the way he played the game, because he could have went on to a far higher level, far higher level, and it was heartbreaking. I want to forget. I mean, this is how this is how far we've come. I remember our first kind of trophy I can remember as being up for was the League Cup final when Ray Rovers beat us mm-hmm. and, and McStay missed the, missed the penalty mm-hmm. and I remember being more heartbroken for him because mm-hmm. you could just see it in his face and, and luckily later on that year we, we beat Airdrie in the Scottish Cup final but again that just shows you how far the club's come in that space of time Can, can you believe the previous guest was uh, Walter Smith and Walter was with Andy Roxburgh the coach of a Scotland side that became European champions the only Scotland side that's ever been mm-hmm. champions of Europe. Paul McStay played in it. Mm. I f- that side is forgotten. Nobody yeah. talks about it, nobody writes about it, whereas we're a nation that is super proud of yeah. just about anything except when we actually do achieve yeah. something. And I think that links with... I've never found that, that Paul McStay is, maybe outside Celtic, uh-huh. appreciated or liked or talked about mm-hmm. as a great... At the time, he had to cope with a lot of people talking about, well, it all, a Ray yeah. Wilkins argument... Yeah. Kind of only goes sideward, and that. What is it that we lack about appreciation about him, his type of player, and also that side that, that maybe about two years before you were born? But we were champions of Europe, and it's just been discarded. What, I don't know. It's, it's, why it's, are we like that? We are. 
we're kind of country at times. We we like to big up the underdog, and we like we're all for the underdog. But as soon as somebody achieves anything, we're kind of try to knock them down. And um, I, I don't understand why I, because I listened to that podcast actually, and I couldn't believe that I'd never heard of it. I mean, I've heard of the World Cup final team, but maybe, maybe that's what I'm saying. Where they we went lost. on. They went on from uh, from that to play in the World Cup. But I'd never heard of us winning that. And again, yeah, it's bizarre that that's never been spoken about. But yeah, maybe I'm the only reason that. I, I can't even maybe um, relate to that is because being a Celtic fan, he is loved. I mean, he's the maestro. He's loved within the club. And I mean, I've, I've been brought up in his goals and his passing and stuff. So Calm on the ball, like you said you were sweeping at the back. I, but just, just that just sense just of pure, order. Pure relaxed. And I said two-footed when he wanted to be as well. He could get a goal, you know. Newsflash. In, in an age of fake news, yours is not. Darren Fletcher, legend. Yes, we're the same age. We would have played in that final. Right. Line of duty is flying. Oh, Mrs. Girl. Fletcher loves it. Well, I feel a lot better now that they pumped us. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, was playing because that was Thank one you. of the. I think that was one of the legends. That Thank you, of, One of the legends that grew it around was the true. game. It wasn't oh, well, fake that's, news. That's good. I, I remember getting awfully excited. Now. There's this fella from LA texting me, DMing me. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, when you were out walking the dog, one of the things you picked up on what you were watching on Barcelona was this proof. That it's ability and reading and vision, not height and power. Aye. Did did that bring well, an end to the Aberdeen thing? No, or? it didn't. Aberdeen were great at that because it's one thing again that we still not. I remember I was signed with Aberdeen at the time, and the big fella's passed away, and he was a lovely man. So I'll not think his name, just but the guy who was picking our district team. I was signed with Aberdeen, and to get out of school, I took uh, mm. a big, a big, lovely lad was mm. Michael Brill. He'd never kicked a ball in his life, but he was massive, and he just wanted to get out of school, so he came with us. And in our trial, we won 5-0. I scored two from a sweeper, and I didn't make it to the final selection. And Michael, who had never kicked a ball before, got picked for it but because it he was a mammoth. And it was just... It, it was like you felt like you were in the dark ages sometime. The, the comparisons with our game to Barca are hard because they have that sort of innate ability. But we're never going to get there if we don't strive. Thank you know. You, and I think you. something that really bothers me recently is, again, we've got to be aware... Of, of our limitations in terms of the, just the ability, but the way Northern Ireland are going about it, mm-hmm. and Iceland are going about it, I don't understand how we're not achieving those sort of things. And, I mean, I, I've i never been to a major tournament. I was 14 in 98, and I thought, oh, this is going to be it. Yeah. And I've been desperate to go to one since. And, and I remember that the Poland game at the last one, and I went to Dublin, actually, for the, for the Scotland-Ireland game. And Ireland were there for the taking that day. Mm-hmm. And we didn't end so many times over the last couple of seasons. And that Poland game, I think it was Lewandowski with the free kick. Mm-hmm. It was schoolboy stuff, but it was a 90-second minute. And before it was even hit, you went, this is going to go in. Just defend, be big, be brave, be strong. And it happens all the time, whether it be rugby or whatever. I think Andy Murray's the only one kind of breaking the mould. Even then, now and again, you'd think sometimes... He's, he's been what he's achieved is, is legendary. But I'm thinking sometimes in those finals, he, he could be up in five or six titles. But I remember what was it, Scotland versus Australia a couple of years ago in the Rugby World Cup. And the reason I say this, and it might sound harsh, is because nobody will know more what I'm saying than the boys on that park. Mm-hmm. They'll know it was there for the taking. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of this sort of glorious loser tag we've, we now, for some reason, seem to revel in. It's, we need to get rid of it. You're into, I mean, you're into quite deep. Sort of social territory there right. because you, you, in some way, we're saying that there's not only a national character, but that it repeats over the yeah. generations. It, Jamie Murray and his brother is another one who's excluded from it. Yeah. He's a fan. And he's, have you any idea why we're like that? Well, you've identified it. You've said yeah. what it is. We both agree that it happens repeatedly. Because we accept. It. I mean, again, it was uh, the couple of ones I remember was where it was when we had Italy at home, and that was a, it was under Big Eck, and it was a yeah. great campaign. Yeah, yeah, it was. But. Again, they had the writing all over it that we knew it was going to happen and we kind of seem, again, instead of saying we should have qualified, we feel as if we we always feel hard done by. But on that night, I mean, OK, I don't want to take this yeah. down the wrong road. On that night, the Spanish referee gives a, gives a foul. Aye. I think Perucci Aye. either commits a foul and it gets given to them. Not, yeah. that, I mean, that was one of the worst decisions I've ever seen was, in my life. But if I, I think right as well was Ferguson's goal not offside. So, I mean, these things come around. Even and I out. think we kind of, I mean, we'll take it all day long, but these things happen both sides. We always seem to be remembering the moments that went against us <laughs> instead of just being bigger, being brave. I mean, like watching that Iceland team was a breath of fresh air. And the way, I mean, sorry for a, a lot of your listeners, but the way to beat England <laughs> was, um, was, it was just amazing to watch. And, I was, and it was just the way 
they're just a team. They do the right things right. They defend properly and they run their arses off for each other. You know, they're there for each other. And again, I keep saying this word, and I know it's easy to say this sitting from sitting from an armchair watching it, but being brave. I mean, the way you're speaking, and we've talked about football mm-hmm. before, and it, okay, it helps yeah. that we agree, we, that we like the yeah. same things. If, if you've set aside your career and what it's done for you and the enjoyment, did, did you ever think, like, I could teach this? I could coach? I probably... I mean, because I, I, I do love it, and I, but I think we're, we're from a different generation. I don't think... What I'm saying, I think it resonate with a lot of people because maybe it was maybe it's Sky Sports and B Team. We're watching a lot more. We're, we're able to watch, you know, foreign thingies and just the way people keep the ball and stuff. But I mean, <laughs> like, I love them dearly. But I kind of watch a game of football with my dad. You know, they're just shouting at TV and then uh, still at Celtic games and stuff. You know, some of the old boys are just shouting absolute nonsense, <laughs> and you've just got to kind of black it out. I mean, I, I believe I, I said it to you before, like. The angriest I've ever been at Celtic Park was seeing Neil Lennon getting booed for keeping yeah, the ball, geez. for passing it back, and it was it, it was driving me mad. I mean, they we're in the Champions League, and because he passed it sideways, I think people were going off their nut. Okay, there's a, apparently there's a, um, a drinking game that gets played by people who are indicating that occasionally I repeat themes. Okay, very clever, well spotted. <laughs> okay, gives you a chance a chance to drink, <laughs> but. <laughs> That's not unique to us. It's something that horrifies us, and it's been proven subsequently that it's just infantile to think like that. Yeah. But Charlie Rexach, who played with Cruyff and coached with Cruyff, said yeah. that when they took over in 88, mm-hmm. the camp now was like Parkhead that day. Yeah. What are you doing? Not getting the ball into the box quickly. Yeah. When there's nobody there, why have you turned back and started again? That's just nonsense. Get it up the mm-hmm. park. That was mm-hmm. the camp now. That was a philosophy that... Now, anybody who held it would be ashamed of, embarrassed. They would hide yeah. that past as if they were the Wiesenthal's were yeah. after them. So it's not unique to us. And they changed. Mm-hmm. You know, they had that embedded and Cruyff changed them. So, OK, they were dealing with a maestro. But what I'm arguing is that you can take that mentality, shred it, learn, teach youth, teach yeah. coaches, teach journalists yeah. to speak and think and analyse differently. Well, I think Brendan Rodgers has been huge for us up home but I mean what he's achieved this season has been incredible and what the mind blowing thing for me is the players who were there last year are like all new signings Bruni's been a revelation he's played the best I think he's Scott Brown's and probably the best season of his career Stuart Armstrong Cal McGregor Craig Gordon Boyata all these players who were already there have just went up 10, 20, 30% I had, uh, had the privilege the other night actually when he uh I won an award back home in Scotland and he presented it with me and I said to him, I think it was the Man City game in the Champions League this year and I think what people forget when that three each game, Man City won 10 on the bounce. They were flying. They were, they were absolutely flying. flying. Yeah. I said to him, it's the first time I've ever got out of my seat watching my team defend hmm. because they were just getting after him, hunting mm-hmm. in packs. You know, mm-hmm. it was compact. It was brilliant to watch and he's also, he's made it, he, he speaks to the fans and says, uh, like especially, I was at the game at the weekend playing Hearts and they've got all ten men squared right in the centre of pitches. I don't care who you are, maybe you miss it. But that's hard to break down. You have to have patience, you know. Yeah. You have to keep the ball and draw them out and back in. It, it, it's not easy. And not make errors, not give it away, yeah. not let them break and then get one. And then and he's educated fans about that. He's, he's, he's said to people, he's came out and says, you need to be patient. And I think it, people have responded. Fans have definitely responded. They're a lot more patient at Parkhead, I think, now knowing what he's what he's trying to achieve and there'll be there'll be obviously these things change but right now you know what I think he's doing not just for us but for the Scottish game and what I think people forget about Brendan I mean he came closer than Benitez or Klopp has came to winning that league Mm -hmm. you know he was he was a Scottish he was a ball here away from it you Mm -hmm. know he really that slips kind of cost him and um and he's lost Suarez the next season or thing, but what the way his team's played at Swansea, you know, I think he's been fantastic for the Scottish game. And hopefully, with the the run we've been on, the gauntlet's laid down, and then you hope uh, that other teams rise to the challenge because they need to. The rest of Scotland, the uh, teams will need to raise their game to compete. I think it's absolutely right. I think that um, you learn by seeing. You learn by other people taking the risks that you might be afraid to make, whether you're a director of football or a president or a player or a scout. Mm -hmm. I think you can change mentalities and it's one of the dreams I've had that Sky's investment of 21 years of Spanish football will have 
disseminated, well, it's sent little ripples through yeah. youth clubs or schools mm. or wherever I go, speaking to the professionals in the game, which I was doing last night. I don't want to rant on about Barcelona, but this is about the Spanish football yeah. mentality, which I think is akin to basketball. You use, yeah. you circulate, you trick, you pull, you yeah. look for... I, I believe that there'll come a stage, and I yeah. believe that there are youngsters coming through now, at United, at Chelsea, maybe it'll be in your club, hopefully it'll be in mine, who want to practice to play the game the way that you've talked about, the way that yeah. we like watching. Yeah. So that little ripple thing may be happening as a consequence of Brendan. But so, it's hard with these things as, as well, because, as I say, Barca definitely showed the way, but it's... The, these players, Iniesta and Javi, and even like players like Scholes, who's he's well my height. I played a, a charity game against Scholes, and on one of his first touches, he took a bit of heavy touch, and I nearly got off him. And his second touch, he took a bit of heavy one again, I nearly got it, and it took me the fourth time to figure out he's done it to me every time, and just drawing <laughs> me in, and me going, oh, and then he's just round me, and then the last one, he nutmegged me for, for a laugh, I think, and went away. So it's these guys... I kind of left football because I'd never, I was never going to get where I wanted to be. I think being... That was an act of choice. Well, I was, the thing is, I was a sweeper and I, I thought, felt very comfortable in any, any kind of circumstance playing sweeper, but sweeper was dying out. And I think the way I played and sort of, I like, I mean, being a bit of a short arse, you know, I'm a bit of an ankle biter, you know, I like a challenge. And so I, I thought, everybody thought, including me, the move up to old midfielder would be seamless. Now, I was good at it, um, but I was nowhere near as good as I was as, as I was a sweeper for reasons... I, I don't know, and uh, and but getting there, you know, I then realised with playing at Mortal stuff that was probably the highest I was going to get. So that made the choice a lot easier when I had another year at Morton or pursuing the acting. I, that that I went for the acting, but what's sick? What I was going back to is that having now went, to, I've now played in all these places that I dreamed of. I'm about to play at Parkhead for the <laughs> third time. I've played at Old Trafford. I've played at Stamford Bridge. I've played at Wembley. And, in some ways, it does feel a bit perverse that I'm, I'm running out in all these grounds in front of these massive crowds and playing with my heroes. You know, I mean, I, I've been very lucky with my job that I've met some true legends, and I mean proper legends, you know, like John Connery, Michael Caine, Robert Redford, like Royley. But the only time I've ever... I was shaking when I met Henry Larson. I couldn't speak Gosh. to him. I, I could not speak to him. And I was sitting beside him in the dressing room, and I actually think I'd, I'm going to meet him again and... I hope I can explain to him like I wasn't because people I don't you know what people are thinking. <laughs> There's more about me than I, I, than I showed the last thinking time. you're like an arrogant prick or something because you're not talking. <laughs> but I just I couldn't I couldn't function around him. Um, I think for all I think for all of us, who, let's say Scots are yeah. are proud of a man of achievement, your achievements, and I, I think I've explained to you that because I live abroad, I hadn't yeah. been aware of line of duties emergence when it came out. I hadn't seen the pre publicity when it came out. I, there's a, there's a, what a good actor that is. Yeah. And you were English, as far as I was concerned, <laughs> literally. And that must be given to you yeah. an awful lot. But we're, we're proud of Scots who achieve. And I think that it'll be pleasant for people who would be daunted meeting you and, and thrown by this famous guy. And we'll come on to a line of duty in a minute about the level of yeah. fame you said has gone off the scale with the, the last series. It'll be, it'll be nice for them to know that even the greats yeah. get a bit daunted around their heroes. Yeah, too. well, because I mean, it's, it's. I suppose it goes both ways. I think they when you when you meet them, they all get a bit kind of flipping out about if they're watching TV. But yeah, I mean, especially sports stars. But if you're a football fan, you know. And, and as I was going back to earlier, when I kind of grew up, we still it wasn't the best time. But then when the Anil era arrived, and this team just kind of blew away everything before them, and I'd never seen them. And we had the new stadium, and before that, I mean. Like being at Hamden and stuff, it was miserable, you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, my, my first, I got, I was called a Jonah after my after my first couple of games in the old jungle. I was a bit of boy, and I think we got, I remember we got beat by Motherwell after Carol Muggleton dropped the ball and Dougie Arnott scored, and then we got beat by Dun, Dundee United. Wayne Biggins missing a sitter, and and I was thinking, how the hell do you think I'm unlucky? It's the team at Pish, mm-hmm. you know. And um, it just was, it was, and it going into. I remember being in school singing Sack the Board at primary school assembly. <laughs> you know, and um, then this new area arrived with this new stadium and you got Henrik Larson with his dreadlocks and it was just, it was something I'd never experienced before and he's, I mean, maybe somebody like Dumbelli at the minute has got a shot, but we, what is incredible, what we got at Larson, we got his best years. He was genuine, world class. 
what he went on to win the European Cup with Barca after us, mm. win the league with Man United, but we had him at his very best. And to see him at full flight was was magnificent. It really was. And I mean, I was behind the goal for the um, I was in the Jock Steen stand, which is the way Celtic shoot in the second half. And so I was directly facing that incredible goal he scored against Rangers in sixteen, where he took it down. He's not Meg Conham and Chick Claus and it was just pure poetry in motion, you know. And we're not very well renowned in the west of Scotland for being the most open with our feelings, but they're sitting there with your big brother and, you know, you're just on the verge of tears of happiness, you know. The same, actually, um, we uh, I was with my brother at, when we beat Barcelona 2-1 and just that night, it's just, it, it was magical. Did they, isn't it strange? We've talked about people's misapprehension of you, your regional guy picking a big fella at you. You look back now, don't you think it's, it's just amazing that Fyne would have him and they're playing him in midfield. They have no clue what they've got. They've gone to war with him about what, what, you know whether he can go when his contract. Just the most unbelievable misuse of res- happy for your club, yeah. great super. But how 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 can you possibly have a a winner like that, a mentality like that, a footballer like that, and and misuse it? So I think a lot of it's got to be with surroundings as well. I mean, even. In little bits I went around it. I mean, even in acting, put it that term, I've never been in little bits of football. If you're not happy, it affects everything in your life. If you're in a place that's doesn't comfortable, you're not surrounded by people who want the same things as you and that stuff. You know, I, I mean, point. it affects me when I'm. I mean, I, I did something. Actually, it was a really good job, but I've been stuck in. What was the last one I was, I was in Bucharest or outside the middle in Romania in a cave. At, five in the morning freezing your arse off and it's hard to produce your best work when <laughs> you know when you're in that situation but I think I think what he realised and I think what Brendan Rogers is sort of realised in a minute is we're a massive club when you're up obviously money wise we can't compete but we're the support we have worldwide and you're idolised he'll be a god forever man up there you know and you feel players who go on and I, I, I think more than a few People want obviously people want to test themselves about the best, but there'll be a few players who went down south and just I think they realise what what they're missing up north now, you know, just in terms of the size of the club. I remember um, when he came and he learned the system at Barcelona. It was incredible because Eto wouldn't give him the ball originally, yeah. and he made the runs because I'm Henrik. He was doing the right runs, yeah. but he was he just knew that when uh, his previous club I made the run, the ball comes to me. Yeah. At bus one, it wasn't like that for two reasons. Eto was jealous and held the ball and said, no, I'm not having you in my team, which happens in football. And the system said, you're not getting it when you run. Your system, the system get Chavi and yeah. maybe it was Ed Mielsen or Iniesta. Would be, no, you, Deco, you get the ball when we say it's right. Yeah. So he had to relearn that and he did. And when, when he began to make an impact in, on the camp, I remember they did, it was, it was sort of goosebumps because... That was at a time when Ronaldinho was idolised. Mm-hmm. That he, would, the club called him the rock and roll signing, and that's what it felt like too. Mm-hmm. Yet Larson was getting at the camp now in a brief time of being there, bigger roars yeah. if he came off yeah, in the seventieth minute, yeah, coming Larson, on. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. They and the you yeah. talked about feelings. The Catalans are not ones. Well, you know, yeah, no, spent you, you, you spent some time in yeah. Catalonia. Well, you know, you said they're there. A little bit spiky as personality. Can what I remember bizarre. What I always remember what, that time. I always remember after that game, that famous interview with Henri going. I didn't see Ronaldinho. I didn't see you know, what I, remember, I say it was Henrik Larsson because he did. He changed the game with them yes. two incredible little passes. Yes. And there was another one actually. He was right through, and I think it was Ronaldinho. And we were all screaming at the telly for him to pass it. But yes, see, I, 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 I believe I've told you before. I spent a lot of time because I used to live on and off in Girona uh, near Barcelona and. Um, Ah, they're fierce, fierce people. Um, yeah, he cracked yeah. their emotions. Yeah, I was, I was one of them. Again, one of my favourite members. I watched the uh, Barca, the second Barca Man United final in the square in Barcelona, and there was oh, like a no hundred thousand people in the street and just up in these massive screens. And I was, and you just felt like you're watching history that night. I mean, Man United are the good side. Yeah. Barca absolutely destroyed them playing this. Actually, it was in Alex Ferguson's book. I remember reading. He talks about this this carousel thing. You can just see it. The Man United players are getting dizzy. Mm. You know, chasing the ball. It was just. It was football at its purest form. It was perfect. That superiority of numbers, where if Messi drops back and you haven't anticipated it, or you you haven't got a man tracking him all yeah. the time, it's three v two or four v yeah. three. And if you allow those players one man extra, yeah. 
It's just good night. But that was Thanks one of my favourite things as well. Like when we when we beat them, I remember being my brother because they absolutely pummeled us that night. Mm. And uh, Fraser first, but there is, I mean, again, because I'm a Celtic fan, but there is something special about a Champions League night at Parkhead. Yeah. You do feel like anything can happen. I remember we were we were one nil up, and you're thinking you're just waiting on them breaking through, and it went on and it went on and it went on. I think it got to like the 80th minute or something. We went, we might get a draw at this. Mm. We want to think we're going to win. Mm. We think we might get a draw at this. Mm. I think it was Xavi, it slipped. Miss and Tony Watts just... Takes a little swipe at it. Tony Watts just bombed right through. And I remember like, because we're watching it, like, is this going to happen? <laughs> is this going to happen? Yeah. And then just, what a cool finish for the boy. Mm. And then after I remember, because I thought I read the day before, I'm sure I read the day before, Messi just had a kid. And he hadn't scored the night before, so he had the dummy in his sock that he was going to pull out and thingy. And he scored, but it was like the 93rd minute or something. And he went for it. I was watching him, mm. he went for it, and then he, he thought better of it. So uh, I was kind of, I was a good feeling going, I, we halted Messi's celebration. You've left a little lot behind um, at Girona. Aye, I am. Um, Real Madrid turning up at, at Girona. Girona Aletti yeah. turning up at Girona. It's a beautiful city, and, and lovely, lovely people. But again, I went up, I was out there with the, with the girl I was seeing, and, um, but I, I found it bizarre, because I, I was very keen to learn Spanish. Uh-huh. But they wouldn't speak Spanish no. there. It was Catalonian no. or... More or than English. Barcelona, that's Catalan yeah. heartland. Yeah. What a gorgeous city, really, really lovely people. I uh, had uh, a great time. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket. You can keep up with everything that we do, within reason, by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. How many times do I have to tell you? Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back. Sign up. That grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book, Barca, The Making of the Greatest Team in the World. It's my account of the Guardiola era at the Camp Nou from 2008 until 2012, plus Tito, Tata and Adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now, but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project. If you choose to buy direct at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon. <laughs>